I couldn't believe my luck when I found that Craigslist posting for a cheap one-bedroom apartment downtown. At $500 a month, it seemed too good to be true for a broke college kid like me. I fired off an email to the landlord right away. A few days later, I was standing outside the dingy three-story walk-up on Monroe Street, trying to ignore the faint smell of cigarettes and piss in the air. The landlord, Frank, was a burly guy in his 60s with a gruff demeanor and leathery skin, a heavy-set armadillo of a man. Previous tenant moved out in a hurry, Frank grunted, jingling the keys as we headed up the stairs. His raspy voice reminded me of a lifelong smoker. That's why the price is so low. Oh yeah? Why'd he leave so quickly? I asked. Frank just shrugged those broad shoulders. The apartment itself wasn't too bad, if a little dated. Cramped kitchen with an ancient oven and fridge. Decent-sized living room with a big window. Tiny bathroom with a clawfoot tub. And a bedroom just big enough for a full-size bed and dresser. I could make this work. I'll take it, I proclaimed eagerly. Visions of being free from student housing dancing in my head. All right, kid, Frank rumbled. I'll get the paperwork started. I moved in the following weekend with my few boxes of clothes, books, and a cheap Ikea dresser I'd snagged off Craigslist. As a 20-year-old townie at the City University, I didn't have much in the way of possessions yet. In those first few days, the neighbors seemed quiet and kept to themselves. The hallway was pretty much always deserted. Perfect for getting my studies done without distractions. Then one sunny afternoon, I struck up a conversation with a nice enough looking guy named Devin out walking his scruffy mud. He was probably in his early 20s, thin and pale with shaggy brown hair that looked perfect for an indie band. We chatted about our hometowns and the usual get to know you college kid stuff. But then he got a weird look on his face, like he just remembered something disturbing. Oh man. You didn't know about what happened in your apartment, did you? My heart skipped a beat. No. What are you talking about? Devin's eyes went wide, and he glanced around quickly as if someone might overhear. Then he leaned in close, lowering his voice to an urgent whisper. Dude, the last tenant who lived there? He was murdered a couple months ago. By some psycho neighbor down the block. I felt like I'd been punched in the gut. Murdered? You're kidding me. But Devin's face was dead serious. He went on, keeping his voice low and intense. Apparently it was over some drug deal gone wrong. The neighbor just freaking lost it and murdered the guy in his apartment. Like full on psycho shit. I felt dizzy, picturing some crazed addict breaking in and attacking a helpless victim. But what did he do? How did he kill him? Devin shook his head slowly, his eyes haunted. From what I heard, it was really brutal, man. Like, torture brutal. A chill went through me. You mean he tortured the tenant? Yeah, Devin said, his voice taking on a grim tone. Cops said the scene was totally messed up. Blood everywhere, bits of skin and stuff all over the place. I thought I might vomit right there on the sidewalk. Devin pressed on in a hushed tone. But here's the creepiest part. After he killed the guy, the psycho didn't even try to cover it up or get rid of the body. He just left it there in the freaking apartment. My knees went wobbly as horrific images flashed through my mind. I was living in the very place where someone had been so savagely slain. Their mutilated body just... left to rot. They caught the neighbor pretty quick after, Devin said. But still, how fucked is that? That you're living where that shit went down? I could barely speak. Do you think... the police missed anything when they cleaned up? Devin's face twisted in revulsion. Dude, I sure as hell hope not. That night I barely slept. Every small creak and groan of the building made me jolt awake, heart pounding. Were those footsteps in the hall? Someone trying to break in to finish the job? Paranoid thoughts raced through my feverish brain. Had that psychotic murderer smeared blood and gore across the very walls surrounding me? Were there still flecks of the victim's remains hidden in the apartment? Soaked into the flooring or trapped in the corner? At dawn's first light, I made up my mind. There was no way in hell I could ever feel at peace in this crime-tainted space. To live in the very place such depravity and darkness occurred, it made my skin crawl. After nearly vomiting in the shower from another wave of horrific thoughts, I threw what few possessions I'd brought into boxes. By 8 a.m., 
I was standing outside waiting for an Uber, my stomach still churning. As I peeled away from the curb, I let out a deep, shaky breath. The nightmare apartment was behind me, but those gruesome mental images would never leave me. I should have known something was off when I saw that Craigslist ad. Storage unit for rent, $25 a month, no deposit. It seemed too good to be true, but I was desperate to find an affordable place to store my stuff after the move. I needed to downsize, at least temporarily until I found a larger apartment. Like an idiot, I didn't think twice about calling the number. The guy who answered sounded friendly enough, a little overly enthusiastic maybe. Yeah man, the unit is still available. When did you want to come check it out? We set up a time for later that evening. I pulled up to the public storage facility around 8 p.m. It was one of those places with the long single-story buildings divided into units with rolling metal doors. This one was pretty run down, with peeling paint and busted outdoor lights leaving parts of the lot cloaked in shadows. I parked and made my way toward the unit the guy had specified, rolling my suitcase behind me. As I approached, I noticed the door was already partway open, dim light spilling out from inside. That's weird, I thought, but I shrugged it off, figuring the guy was just airing it out or something. Hello? I called out, rapping on the metal door. No answer. I pushed it open further and stuck my head in. Hello? Anyone here? The unit seemed deserted. Just a bare, echoey space, maybe ten feet square, lit by a single bare bulb hanging from the ceiling. A few smears of who knows what were visible on the concrete floor. Then I heard a slight metallic scraping sound behind me and whipped around. Too late, I saw a thin figure in a hooded sweatshirt emerge from a shadowy corner, something long and silver glinting in their hands. My heart seized in my chest as I recognized the metallic object as some kind of pipe or bar. A weapon. What the fu- was all I could get out before the person swung the pipe at me. I just had time to throw up my hands in a feeble attempt to block the blow, before an explosion of white-hot pain erupted across my forearms. I stumbled back, crying out, as the hooded figure raised their arms again. Panic and adrenaline surged through me as I turned and threw myself toward the still-open door, half falling, half scrambling on my hands and knees in a desperate bid to escape. Angry shouts erupted behind me, then sudden footfalls giving chase as a second, third, fourth set of feet pounded on the pavement outside. More figures materialized in the darkness, circling me like sharks who smelled blood in the water. I tried to pull myself upright and break into a run, but hands were on me, grabbing at my clothes, my hair, my arms, dragging me back toward that nightmare of a storage unit despite my frantic struggles. A bony fist connected with the side of my head, and I saw stars, my vision kaleidoscoping as I was dragged, half stunned, into the hellish bare space once again. I hardly registered the suitcase being torn from my white-knuckled grip. More hands pinned me face down on the cold, gritty floor, wrenching my arms behind my back until I heard sick crunch of bone amid the fiery wave of agony that engulfed me. I was too stunned to even cry out, just let out a feeble, gurgling moan. Look at this dumbass who walked right into our trap, a mocking voice sneered close to my ear as a knee was jammed into my back. Another pair of hands frisked me roughly stripping my wallet, phone, and any other valuables while I lay helpless. Not even worth the trouble, hardly got shit on him, griped another male voice. Judging by the shuffling weight on top of me, I guess there were at least three or four of them, all sounding like young guys, late teens or early twenties. My hazy thoughts churned a kaleidoscope of fear, confusion, and fury. Who were these punks? What did they want from me aside from what meager valuables I had? Was this just some gang of opportunistic muggers? Or did they have something bigger, more sinister planned? One thing was becoming increasingly, agonizingly clear. They didn't plan to let me walk away from this. Heavy footfalls retreated across the room, followed by a harsh metallic scraping sound like a blade being dragged along the concrete toward me. A new wave of cold dread washed over me at the implications of that chilling sound. Let's just finish this real quick and get out of here, came the bored, detached words that I knew would haunt my nightmares for the rest of my certainly shortened life. I braced myself for whatever brutal end they had in store for me. But then a solid metallic object struck the back of my skull with sickening force. 
white-hot pain and nausea exploded through my head before everything went black. When I finally regained consciousness, I was alone in the dim storage unit, my whole body throbbing with agony. I nearly passed out again from the waves of pain radiating from my smashed arms and bloody head wound. Scraping together what little strength I had left, I managed to pull my battered body across the floor to where my suitcase lay, its contents strewn about after being rifled through. My trembling fingers closed around my phone, miraculously still intact. With hazy urgency, I called police and choked out my words to the operator between ragged gasps, praying they would arrive in time. Those psychopaths could still be lurking nearby. What felt like an eternity passed as I slipped in and out of consciousness, haunted by the mocking laughter of my attackers. But finally, blessed sirens pierced the silence, growing louder as they approached. Police swarmed the storage facility, bursting into the unit with guns drawn to find me in a pool of my own blood. I was rushed to the hospital while they combed the area for the violent gang who had brutalized me. Ultimately, the monsters who orchestrated this trap got away into the night. But I lived to tell the tale, putting the pieces of my life back together one grueling day at a time and trying to put that waking nightmare behind me. So here's the deal. I made one of those classic dumbass decisions you always hear horror stories about. Coming right out of college, I was broke as a joke but still needed my own place. Answering a Craigslist ad for an open room seemed like a no-brainer way to save cash at the time. Man, was I naive. I met up with this guy Ricky at a Starbucks to feel him out as a potential roommate. Scrawny dude, probably mid-twenties, with stringy hair down to his shoulders and a scraggly goatee rocked one of those old slipknot tees that was basically a pit-stained rag at this point. First impression? Definitely gave off some hard loner vibes, if I'm being honest. But he seemed harmless enough, said he worked third shift restocking at a grocery store, and mostly kept to himself. I figured having a shut-in weirdo roomie could be a decent trade-off for cheaper rent. Boy, did I underestimate just how much of a full-blown space Cadet Ricky truly was. Red flags popped up pretty much as soon as he lugged his few belongings into the spare bedroom. For one, the personal hygiene was beyond disgusting. We're talking maybe a shower every ten days or so, if I was being generous with the estimate. Let that level of funk marinate for a bit, then try and picture walking home to that unholy stench wafting from his cave of a bedroom every damn day. I finally got fed up and pulled him aside, trying to be all casual with an A-man, no judgment, just gotta ask. You doing okay health-wise and all that? But Ricky just squinted at me through his greasy curtains of hair and straight up asked, What's the problem? Like he couldn't even comprehend why reeking like he'd been drop-kicked into a sewage plant could be an issue. Needless to say, that went nowhere. Then there was his... diet, if you could even call it that. Dude would come home from his overnight shifts carting these towering stacks of protein powder buckets and flats of liquid egg whites. I'm talking dozens of cartons, man, like he was stocking up for the next apocalypse or something. Every few days, this mental ritualistic process played out where he'd crack open all the egg containers into one of those big soup pots, whisk it into a frothing yellow hell broth, then start chugging it down by the glass with numerous giant scoops of powder mixed in. I'll spare you the details, but anyone who's witnessed the human body attempting to process that ungodly volume of raw egg protein sludge can imagine the bleak viral aftermath. My roommate's bane-like consumption rituals quickly made any shared spaces a biohazard code red without delay. I started seeing these thick, glutinous streaks in the most unfortunate crevices of our humble apartment. My clothes draped over furniture? Splattered in rogue globs? The kitchen floor? Looked like an serial intestinal terrorist went to town. Don't even get me started on the bathroom. Eventually, I went from being constantly low-key unsettled by Ricky's presence to verging on unhinged panic any time he was in the same room. Between the fermented stench that followed him like a tail and his dead-eyed thousand-yard stares, it started feeling like sharing quarters with a feral garage hermit who got lost on an ayahuasca bender years ago. Little things, too, almost imperceptible at first. Just... off. Like if I moved the tasseled fringes of my dingy apartment rug a few inches to the right today, I'd return to them shifted a quarter turn clockwise tomorrow. Same with the shower curtain's precise lopsided hang. 
the angle of my bedroom door being open a notch wider than I prefer. Subtle, obsessive adjustments I could have sworn weren't being made until I was stuck over analyzing every goddamn domestic detail around this waking night terror of a roommate. Ricky seemed to be sleepwalking through our place with calculated lurching steps, compulsively tweaking and disturbing every innocuous detail like a cat paw incessantly batting the same scrunched up paper ball. The dude even left unsettling ambient audio in his wake, low droning mumbles issuing from his perpetually slack-jawed mouth. Sustaining the pattern, yes. The numbers return. I become complete. Just reams of disjointed metaphysical psychobabble always teetering on the verge of coherent meaning, bubbling up from his guttural drawl as he drifted by. The final straw came maybe a month after that first eerie glimpse into my roommate's true detached plane of existence. I was crashing back around 3 a.m. after bar hopping with buddies, stumbling into our place about as sloshed as I've been in recent memory made a beeline for the hallway bathroom without bothering to kill the lights, because at that moment nothing could prepare me for what the darkness was concealing. No joke. I flipped on that sickly vanity bulb and Ricky was straight up crouched on the tile, clawing at his scalp and rocking back and forth like a disturbed mental patient. He'd fashioned this rudimentary foil helmet, like something a schizophrenic hobo whips up to stop the CIA mind rays, and was frantically lathering gobs of some viscous gray slime all over the contours. And as I stood frozen in shock, trying to process what fresh nightmare I'd walked in on, Ricky angled his helmeted head upwards, mouth gaping in a deranged silent howl as he methodically upended an entire blender's worth of that gelatinous sludge over his face in one grotesque cascade. It poured over his eyes, filled every crevice of his contorted features as he shuddered and gulped, streams of the foul pudding-like glop sluicing over his shuddering body. I slammed the door shut so violently I think I cracked the frame, Already, scrambling for my duffel bag and frantically shoving every necessity within reach inside. Made it two blocks in my boxers before doubling over and breaking down into embarrassing sobs, the gravity of just how perilously close I'd been, living to legitimate psychosis fully crashing over me. Slept on a buddy's couch for a week before even feeling steady enough to go retrieve the rest of my belongings, by which point, Ricky had predictably vanished into the ether.